OK, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to see you all. Uh, this is going to be a fairly, uh, fairly data-intensive uh, Chicago's Best Ideas. So I'll be making liberal use of the uh, screens that you see scattered around, uh, around the room. I should say at the outset that this is uh, work that um, I've written jointly with Omri Ben-Shahar, who hopefully a lot of you have uh, or have had for contracts. And really, when we thought about uh, this, this um, project, we're thinking, let's go ahead and tackle the biggest problem in contract law. Uh, and the biggest problem of contract law is the challenge of interpretation. How to figure out uh, what words mean. Uh, and in our view, the ways in which contract interpretation happens are often very unsatisfying. So as all of you uh, know by now, uh, when courts are trying to interpret contracts, they're going to struggle with a, a lot of different methodologies. Perhaps there's an interpretive canon that sheds light on the meaning of a phrase or of a series of phrases. Um, but these interpretive canons can be confusing, arbitrary, contradictory. There's the famous saying that for every canon, there's a, ca a counter canon. Uh, and so oftentimes, the canons and the interpretive rules don't eliminate uncertainty. Well, that's what precedents are for, right? So you can look at the precedents and try and figure out how similar words have been construed by similar courts. Uh, and these two can be confusing. Uh, these two can be contradictory. Uh, and similarly to the canons, uh, we shouldn't think that ordinary people who are tasked with consenting to various consumer contracts are actually going to have any idea what the canons say or what the precedents say. And so as a result, the law often imposes upon ordinary people who aren't advised by counsel contractual terms uh, that they didn't understand uh, and that they wouldn't have actually assented to had they understood the terms of a consumer contract. Um, OK, so we can look outside of contract doctrine and try and find inspiration in other bodies of law that deal with similar problems. And we're going to do that in the talk that uh, I'm giving today. So uh, those of you who've studied trademark law will recognize that in trademark law, a standard approach to the problem of figuring out whether marks are similar to one another, whether a mark has acquired secondary meaning, whether a mark is generic. These are some of the fundamental questions that courts have to answer in trademark litigation, is they don't rely on canons, they don't rely on precedents, but they actually rely on survey evidence, which arises when an expert uh, sends out a survey to hundreds or thousands of people and asks them, after showing them a couple of different brands, a couple of different images, a couple of different advertisements, whether these particular marks are similar or different, whether they'd be likely to be confused or not based on two uh, marks or two ad campaigns or two images that have some similarities and some differences. OK, if you're litigating a trademark in 2018 and you walk into court without a survey performed by a competent expert, you may as well be walking into court in uh, cutoff shorts. Uh, your odds of prevailing without a competent survey are uh, equally dim, uh, whichever uh, mistake you've made. A mistake of the expert hiring variety or, an expert, or a mistake of the sartorial uh, variety. And so what we want to say today is that if surveys are so decisive in trademark and false advertising litigation, why shouldn't they be equally important when we're trying to figure out what a contract means. And so the simple proposal, and you could conceivably put it on a bumper sticker, is to simply use trademark methods for figuring out what pre-contractual messages, like the box of a granola bar, a chocolate bar, we use these surveys to figure out what the message on the outside of a box means, why not use these same methods to figure out what a contract means, particularly where that contract is aimed at ordinary consumers. And the proposal is pretty simple, that where you have a clear consensus among lay people, that that consensus should be the meaning of a contract, and courts should simply follow the consumers who've responded to the survey in a way that suggests there is a clear consensus. 
Sometimes there's not going to be a consensus. Sometimes consumers will be divided when you ask them to read contract language carefully. And in those cases, the courts don't have to throw up their arms and regard a dispute as impossible to resolve. What they can simply do in those instances is fall back on tiebreakers like contra preferentum, right? Uh, interpret the contract against the, against the drafter if there's an ambiguous term, or some of the other policy-based tiebreakers that have long arisen and uh, been adopted in contracts cases. All right, so how do we get started on this? Um, sort of the genesis of this project that Professor Ben Shahar and I put together was in an earlier paper, which arose out of an earlier conference, which was held uh, right here at the law school a couple of years ago. So a couple of years ago, we had a conference about privacy. And uh, in my privacy classes, and I know a few of you have taken those classes, one of the cases that we read that I had um, thought was rightly decided was an opinion, actually two opinions, both authored by the same judge, a great judge in the Northern District of California named Lucy Coe. And Lucy Coe had in front of her a couple of suits, both of which alleged that major technology companies had violated the terms of state and federal wiretap act laws. Okay, so what were these companies doing? These companies were doing something that you're probably used to. You have a Gmail account, and Google was having its machines automatically look at the content in your emails, both in your inbox and in your outbox, uh, and using the words and phrases and patterns that it identified from your emails to show you personalized advertisements, okay? Uh, Google, was, Google was doing this, then Yahoo started doing this. Uh, most of the major uh, providers of free, in, uh, in quotes, free email, uh, were engaged in these kinds of practices. And some enterprising class action attorneys realized, hey, that might actually uh, be a violation of the wiretap laws. All right. uh, Judge Coe looked at two policies. She looked at the Yahoo policy and the Google policy, and as you'll see in a second, they're written very differently. And she decided that the Yahoo policy uh, was clear enough to extract consent from Yahoo users to engage in this practice. And if users consent, then under the wiretap acts, there's no problem. But she also thought that the Google policy was ambiguous and therefore wasn't adequate to inform uh, Google users who were using Gmail of what it was that they were consenting to. Okay, why did Judge Coe reach that result? Well, what I've done and what I'll do in all these slides is highlight the contractual language or the privacy policy language that's at issue in blue. All right, so the Google policy. Uh, you can see, right, ordinarily I wouldn't read slides, but this is being podcast, so I'm going to make the horrible faux pas of reading some text off a slide. Right, the Google policy says that Gmail reserves the right to pre-screen, review, flag, filter, modify, refuse or remove any or all content from any service. For some services, Gmail may provide tools to filter out explicit sexual content. Okay, does that inform Gmail users that their emails will be scanned for the purposes of delivering them advertisements? Now let's look at the Yahoo policy. Yahoo's automated systems scan and analyze all incoming and outgoing communications to match and serve targeted advertising. Same question. Does that put Yahoo users now on notice of the automated content analysis of their emails? All right. You definitely get a sense from looking at those two policies of what Judge Coe was thinking, right? Uh, so what we said is, let's actually try out these two policies will randomly assign consumers to read either the Gmail policy, which was found inadequate, or the Yahoo policy, which was found adequate, and then see what they say on this question of whether their hypothetical agreement to that language would um, authorize their email provider to, pro to uh, scan their emails and then show them personalized advertisements. And because that's a somewhat difficult concept, we gave our, uh, the people we surveyed, we gave people an example of what that might mean. We said, okay, suppose that your emails often use the words tired or sleepy. Well, you might start seeing advertisements for mattresses uh, from a bedding store. And then we asked people, okay, on a five point, on a four point scale in this instance, if you consented to this policy, would it definitely, probably, probably not, or definitely not allow your email service provider 
to engage in that content analysis for the purposes of showing you personalized ads. The results surprised us, okay? So what we saw was that people who read the Google policy and people who read the Yahoo policy, no statistically significant differences between the two with respect to whether their email service provider was authorized to engage in the conduct. Moreover, overwhelmingly, in both situations, people thought that the email service provider would be able <coughs> to have its machine scan their emails for the purposes of showing them personalized advertisements. And this wasn't because they really loved the practices of email providers doing that. In fact, in a separate question, we asked them to assess, okay, how intrusive is this practice of automated content analysis for the purpose of showing you um, personalized ads? And on a scale of one to 10, the mean response was 7.63. So people don't like the practice, but they think regardless of whether they were shown the Gmail language or the Yahoo language, that, uh, that they would have authorized it had they agreed to the language that they were shown. Now, one possible explanation for this is that our people just weren't reading the contractual language that we showed them, and that would suggest if nobody's reading anything, then that would explain the result. So one thing we did to measure that is we asked our respondents a series of pretty difficult factual questions about the policies they had read, and almost two-thirds of the sample answered those difficult policy questions correctly. So what happens if we kick out the 37% of the sample who answered the questions incorrectly? Same results. No distinction of any statistical significance between the people who read the Yahoo policy and the people who read the uh, Gmail policy. And that result really surprised us, and it made us think that sometimes lay people read, contra read contractual language in a very different way than lawyers do. All right, so after we got these results, I started talking to uh, my wonderful colleague, Professor Ben Shahar, who uh, knows way more about contract law than I do. And uh, we sort of think, started thinking about whether we could generalize this proposal to consumer contracts more generally, having just started with the narrow question of privacy policies. And so we built a big survey, uh, sent it out over a couple of different waves. All in all, about 2,600 respondents uh, participated in our surveys and our experiments. And we wanted to make sure that the sample population was as close to the adult US population as possible. Okay? So we got a census-weighted sample. 50% women, 50% men, roughly. Uh, African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, Caucasians, same proportions in our sample as show up in the US Census. We did the same thing for the other variables of interest like region of the country, uh, age, and education levels. And in each case, we asked our respondents to review a couple of vignettes that were all gonna be based on questions in which courts had struggled with contractual ambiguity. Uh, close cases, cases that made it up to the courts of appeals. So what I'm gonna do for the most of the rest of my time is march you through, through three such cases and show you the results. And you'll see that sometimes courts are getting it right and sometimes courts are deviating uh, from what ordinary respondents do in the kind of way that we saw in that uh, Yahoo case. All right, so first case is from Illinois, Illinois Court of Appeals case. And this is sort of a garden variety contractual dispute where a court is called upon to interpret a homeowner's insurance and that home, a homeowner's insurance policy, and that homeowner's insurance policy arguably has some ambiguity in it. Okay? So uh, the language at issue is that this policy does not apply to bodily injury or property damage arising out of business pursuits of any insured except activities therein which are ordinarily incident to non-business pursuits. So here's what happens in Moore versus State Farm, okay? What happens in Moore versus State Farm is you have someone who's operating a very small scale babysitting service out of her own home, but she also has kids of her own. So she's taking care of her own kids and she's taking care of the neighbor's kids in exchange for pay. One day, sadly, while she's preparing a child for both her kid and a neighbor's kid, the neighbor's kid reaches onto the stove top, spills some boiling water, and suffers bad burns. Uh, the neighbor sues Moore, and Moore uh, 
is counting on the fact that her homeowner's insurance policy is going to cover both the cost of defending her in the tort suit and any injuries uh, to the neighbor's child. And so, once again, we have to turn to the language of the contract and ask, well, which part of the provision applies? Ms. Moore says that the injury to the child is going to be covered because preparing meals is ordinarily incident to non-business pursuits. It's the kind of thing an ordinary homeowner does. State Farm responds and says, no, 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 we're not on the hook. And we're not on the hook because of that other clause in the contract that says uh, no liability if the injury arose out of business pursuits of the insured. So what was Moore doing? A non-business pursuit or a business pursuit? The court, here's the dispute. Court of Appeals decides that the language is ambiguous. It could go either way. Not clear whether making lunch was covered. And so it sides with Ms. Moore thinking, well, State Farm drafted this policy. They could have made it clearer. They didn't make it clearer. Therefore, they're liable. So we ran language that's almost identical to the State Farm language by our 2,600 ordinary Americans. And we wanted to see both, were they generating a kind of result that's consistent with what the court did? And if we shortened and clarified the language that was testing, would that change people's resu results? Okay, so this is where we move from a survey to an experiment. All right. So half the sample was randomly assigned to read the language, this policy does not apply to bodily injury arising out of business pursuits of the homeowner, except activities that are ordinarily incident to non-business pursuits. Okay, that's the language from State Farm. The other half saw this language, the policy does not apply to bodily injury arising out of business pursuits of the homeowner. Okay, we've gotten rid of that second clause, and we've gotten rid of that second clause uh, so as to do a couple of things. First, we've improved clarity. And second, we've taken away an argument that Moore might be able to make as to why she's nevertheless covered under the State Farm policy. So the hypothesis would be that whatever the baseline level of responses was, when we tested out the shortened exclusion, that people should be more sympathetic to State Farm's argument in that scenario. OK, so here's the data from these experiments. When we tested the actual language from State Farm, we saw what I want to describe as a lack of consensus. It is true that there's uh, a, a few more respondents, um, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe collectively 9% or something like that, who um, uh, favor the insurance company's interpretation. But it's pretty close to 50-50. There's not a clear consensus either way. Okay, what happens when we try the improved clarity, shorter language, and language that's slanted more clearly in the direction of State Farm? Well, not everyone picks up. And you'll see that again and again in the data I'll show you today. But about 10% of the sample really shifts. Okay? And so what we see, once we've tried out the clarified, shorter, more pro-State Farm language, is that we actually um, see a pretty clear consensus. About 57% of the sample is now siding with State, Form, with State Farm. Moreover, the percentage of the sample that says this language is completely ambiguous declines from 19% to just under 15%. Okay? So let's say that there's about 15% of the sample for which the new language really made a difference. And for the rest of the sample, it doesn't seem to have made a difference. All right, what do we take away from that? We take away from that and these experiments, that the court and State Farm got it right, all right? When they held this language to be ambiguous, if you try this out on uh, 2,600 respondents, maybe 1,400 will go one way and 1,200 will go the other way, that sounds like ambiguity to us. Uh, but when we moved to the shortened language, that did make a significant difference, okay? So whereas in the original situation where we were just testing on the exact policy that was at issue at State Farm, the people siding with State Farm outnumbered the people siding with Moore by a ratio of 1.39 to 1. When we tried out the new language, the people siding with State Farm outnumbered the people siding with Moore by a ratio of 2.08 to 1. So pretty significant shift in that ratio. And as I said, fewer respondents thought the language was completely ambiguous. And so we say that really strengthens the result in State Farm. State Farm had available to it much clearer language. All they had to do was X out that last phrase if they wanted to. 
And had they done so, then we think uh, their argument shouldn't, should have prevailed. The fact that they didn't means that the court was appropriate to deem them the loser in that case. We'll stay in Illinois for our second vignette. Uh, now we're going to think about a contract not to compete, a covenant not to compete. Uh, you'll see a lot of these in employment contracts where an employee will agree to be bound by a promise not to compete with the employer for some amount of time following the cessation of employment. So I, you know, McDonald's gets me to extract a promise that I won't work for Burger King for 12 months or 24 months after uh, I leave uh, McDonald's employee. Okay, so uh, the language at issue in this case, Cambridge Engineering versus Mercury Partner, involves classic uh, non-compete language. But there's a little bit of a twist in the way this case got litigated. So the language at issue in this case says the employer shall not, for a period of 24 months following the termination of his or her employment, engage in any activity for or on behalf of employer's competitors or engage in any business that competes with employer anywhere in the United States or Canada. That sounds like pretty broad language to us about what the employer cannot do uh, for the 24 months after uh, he or she is fired or quits. Okay. In this case, here's the twist. The twist is that there are doctrines in Illinois and in a lot of states that say a non-compete agreement that's too broad is going to be struck down as contrary to public policy and therefore invalid. And that's the argument that the employee was making in Cambridge. All right? So the employee said, yes, I signed this, but uh, it's so broad that it would prevent me from taking any job with a direct competitor. And if that's what the contract means, it's invalid. It's unenforceable. The employer said, no, no, no. It's not that broad. It's actually narrow. It's not going to prevent you from taking any job with a competitor. It's just going to uh, prevent you from taking a sales job, given that you worked as a salesperson for us. All right. So we have this fight about what this language means. And the outcome of that fight will uh, determine whether the employee is bound by this language that was part of the employment agreement. So the only thing we did is we simplified the language a little bit uh, that we showed to everyone. And we, we asked people uh, to imagine a scenario where an employee is uh, a salesperson for a medical um, device company. And they've agreed to uh, the following non-compete clause. The employee may not engage in any activity for a competitor of this company. We made up names for the company. Or engage in any business that competes with the company. Uh, linguistically, it's identical to the Cambridge language. It's just a little bit shorter. Uh, OK, and then we said there are, that the employee in question who signed this agreement was a, um, uh, was a, sales, uh, a sales officer for the previous employer and had been offered and accepted a job in the human resources department of a company that directly competed with their original employer. Okay? Straight up interpretation question. And then the question we pose to people is, does the signed agreement prevent the employee from taking the human resources job with a direct competitor? This is what we got. Uh, so when people read the um, initial language, uh, they, um, uh, they overwhelmingly thought that the that the, um, that the language at issue was quite broad. And they thought, yeah, not only is this is having signed this contract going to prevent you from working in sales for a direct competitor, but it's going to prevent you from working as a human resources officer for the <coughs> direct competitor as well. Now, for this scenario, we didn't run an experiment. We just showed people the exact same language. Uh, and then we did the same thing like six months later to see if our results were fairly stable. And as you're seeing, there's a little bit of statistical noise there. But in both situations, right, where we're sampling a nationally representative sample, we're getting a very clear consensus of people construing this non-compete agreement quite uh, broadly. The ratios are even more significant, much more significant than they were in the State Farm versus Moore case. So what we see in this vignette that's based on Cambridge is 
a very powerful consensus that the non-compete agreement means what it purports to say. Uh, and you might think, well, maybe that's a little bit surprising. Perhaps your, uh, your hunch about lay people is that where there's this dispute between an employer that's trying to prevent an employee from earning a livelihood after resigning from a previous job, people will be sympathetic to the employee, not to the employer. Most people are employees. Most people are not employers. So you might think, hey, perhaps the bias should be in favor of the little guy. But we don't see that at all in our data. What we see in the data is that when we ask people to interpret this non-compete agreement, they're basically textualists. They're basically embracing a broad uh, scope for the non-compete agreement, where the uh, non-compete agreement seems to be written in a uh, broad way. So I want to say more. We want to score one for the courts. Cambridge, we want to score an, uh, another one uh, for the courts. Uh, had the court bothered to actually figure out what this contract would have meant to, this, to the ordinary employee, they would have reached the same result. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about a case where we're going to see a divergence. And apologies to, um, a first year or se to the first year and second year students who had me for elements, because we talked about this case in elements. Um, uh, so you're going to hear about it again. Uh, so I had my elements students uh, this year and last year read a, another Illinois case, Storybook versus Carlson. And in that case, the ambiguity is going to be about a bonus agreement, a bonus agreement between a firm and employees of the branch. And what the employer wanted to do is encourage its branch employee, employees to be really good salespeople, to generate a lot of business. And it did so by drafting a bonus agreement that would give them more money if there were, if there were a high level of, um, of sales being generated at the branch that they worked at. So this is the oral agreement that the employer and the employee agreed to be bound by and um, was later codified. Okay? They said, if the branch earns between ten dollars and $20,000, then a maximum bonus of 5% shall be paid to each employee. But if the branch earns $20,000 and over, then a maximum bonus of 22% shall be paid to each employee. All right. Uh, you might have a hunch that there could be some ambiguity there. All right. uh, what's the ambiguity? Well, the ambiguity is what happens if that branch earns $21,000 or $22,000? Right. We know that that kicks in the 22% bonus, but is it a 22% bonus of amounts over $20,000? Or is it a 22% bonus of the total sales earned at the branch? Doesn't seem clear to me. Okay? And so the court had to resolve this question of how much of a bonus the employees were entitled to after, lo and behold, the branch earned profits exceeding $20,000. Right? So you can imagine what the employee's argument was. It was, hey, we're entitled to 22,000, we're entitled to 22% of, let's say, the 22,000 that the branch earned. And the employer said, no, 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 you're only entitled to 22% of those amounts exceeding $20,000. And you're entitled to 5% of those amounts between ten dollars and $20,000. You're, and you're entitled to nothing with respect to the first $10,000 that were earned at the branch. So this case goes to a jury trial. And the jury says, we think the employees have it right. The language that's at issue says a maximum of 22% shall be paid to each employee. The condition there is you've got to earn 20000 and over. The jury said, we think the employees win. Pay out the bigger bonus amount. And then something pretty extraordinary happens. The trial court basically enters a judgment notwithstanding the jury verdict. The legal standard for the trial court to do that is extremely high. The trial court essentially has to believe that no reasonable juror could have concluded that the employees were entitled to 22% of the overall sales at the branch. How does the court reach that extraordinary judgment? Well, it made two arguments. One argument is based on an interpretive canon. It's called the last antecedent clause, sort of a, a textual reading of the language that was agreed to. But maybe more important, the court had an intuitive sense that the employee's interpretation of the bonus agreement doesn't make any business sense. 
it thought an employer wouldn't have ever agreed to such high powered incentives where a huge amount of money was going to ride on whether $20,001 or $19,990 were earned at that particular branch. And maybe the court was worried, well, once the, once the, you know, once the sales get into the 19,000s, the employees themselves have a strong incentive to just buy $1,000 worth of junk because it's going to be worth their while to get that larger bonus if the sales exceed $20,000. All right, so it's sort of a pragmatic reading and a textualist reading that caused the district court judge to throw out the jury verdict. We thought this was really interesting, uh, and so we tested on this language, and we tested on language that we thought would clarify what the employer and employee might have been up to. So half of our resp respondents selected at random saw language that was just a little simpler, but otherwise identical to the um, language that was at issue in the Storybrook uh, bonus agreement. Uh, and so it says, if the profits are you know, $1 to $20,000, then a 5% bonus will be paid. If they're $20,000 and over, then a 20% bonus will be paid. That just replicates the ambiguity that's uh, existing in the storybook uh, bonus agreement. Uh, the other half saw language that was my attempt to try and clean this up, right? We showed the other half of the respondent's language says the employee will receive an annual bonus of 5% on any st store profits earned between $1 and $20,000. If the store earns profits above $20,000, the employee will receive a 20% bonus only on those amounts above 20,000 bucks. I was really trying to make it as clear as possible that the employer should be winning this case. And then we said 25,000 in profits have been earned. Uh, we explained the math so that people wouldn't have to do the calculations in their head. And then we asked our respondents whether the uh, employee should be entitled to $5,000, which is the amount that the calculations would point to if the employee's interpretation were correct, or $2,000, which is the amount that uh, would be pointed to if the employer's calculations were correct. All right. When we tried the original bonus agreement language, we actually saw a pretty clear consensus among our respondents that tracked what the jury did. Most of the respondents, at least those who expressed an opinion, thought that the employees had the stronger argument and that a $5,000 bonus should be paid. Okay? But there was a relatively high percentage of the sample, more than one in five respondents said, this language is completely ambiguous. Then we tried my cleaned up language. And here too, kind of interesting, we don't get unanimity, but we see a huge shift right, from with the original language, just under 12% of the sample said the employer should definitely win. And now with the clear language, almost 35% of the sample say the employer should definitely win. So we've got you know, almost a tripling of the percentage of people saying the employer should definitely win, and a reduction, though it's not huge, in the percentage of the sample saying that the language is completely ambiguous. All right, so this suggests that at least with a sample like this, while you're not going to convince everyone, if you really take lawyerly steps to try and clarify otherwise ambiguous language, a pretty good chunk of the sample will notice. All right? So uh, to put these back in terms of ratios, when we tested the original language that was at issue in Storybook, or something really similar, but just a little bit simpler, by a ratio about 1.76 to 1, our respondents went with the employees. And then when we tried out our clarified language, it flipped in the employer's direction, so that about 1.57 respondents were opting for the employer's interpretation for everyone who was preferring the employee's interpretation. And so we want to say, by this method, what the court did in Storybook was totally indefensible, completely indefensible. This is a contract that's written for lay people, right? These were not uh, contracts written by lawyers with um, clients who were advised by counsel. This is an oral agreement that was later memorialized. And uh, we think people overwhelmingly, though not unanimously, uh, are going to have the exact same interpretation that the jury did. And so it was crazy for the court to say that no reasonable person would construe the language in this way. Most reasonable people would have done exactly what the jury did. Now, we're a little bit troubled that even when we presented the clarified language, which we would say, as a matter of law, seems like it ought to be unambiguous, 
that almost 32% of the samples still preferred the employee's interpretation, and that might be a little guy effect. Um, that might be people being uh, inattentive. That might be um, people being uh, confused by math, even as we tried to make the math as simple as it possibly uh, could be. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that are going on, and we can talk about why that is. But on the whole, if we're thinking about where's the consensus, we think this method does a pretty good job of showing what the court got wrong. The, um, the paper, uh, and this, this just came out in the NYU Law Review, uh, the paper that, uh, that I'm speaking about today sort of ran a whole bunch of experiments. I've talked about three of them. And what you see on the chart are the confidence intervals for, um, for these different experiments. And what we're seeing is a few experiments, like the original Moore language, which is the very first line. Uh, that's the language uh, uh, right over here. We're seeing something pretty close to 50-50. This is the clarified Moore versus State Farm language. And then there's some cases where we're, where we're seeing overwhelming consensuses among the respondents. So I think there's some interesting questions about if this newfangled method of contract interpretation were to become a common approach among the courts. You know, there's some questions about, well, how much of a consensus do you need in order to say that language is unambiguous? And those are interesting questions. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about them uh, in the article, and we can certainly talk about them in the Q&A. But what we want to say is lay respondents interpreting consumer contracts often reach a strong consensus. And we think uh, courts absent extraordinary circumstances ought to be held to the kinds of interpretations that these consumers are going to uh, offer. Um, okay, so. The basic, uh, now I'll give you a little bit of a normative argument for why we're doing what we're doing, why you should care about the numbers. And then in a couple minutes, I'll ask uh, you for questions and, uh, and comments. All right. So, um, you know, we've got a couple of different ways in which you might interpret a contract. The standard approach turns to one judge or maybe three arbitrators and asks them to apply the legal training that they got in law school and through their professional careers. But that's one person. Or that's three people. And we're seeing that sometimes smart judges are getting it right if what we think is by right is what did the contract actually mean to people who were similarly situated to the folks who signed it. But we're also going to see circumstances in which they get it wrong, in which there may be something about legal training that causes you to view as clear things that ordinary people would view as ambiguous. And we should think that when we're turning to 1,000 respondents or 2,000 respondents, the likelihood of those systematic errors are much smaller than when we're just turning to one respondent or uh, three respondents. The other thing I want to say on behalf, or another thing I want to say on behalf of the approach, is that at least in the evidence that we've gathered, these results seem pretty stable over time. If we ask the same question in one sample, and then the same question again later to a different group of people, but who are also representative of the overall population, we're getting the same results. Now, we haven't tried this 10 years apart or 20 years apart. We'll do that eventually. But that suggests that there might be really good incentives for firms that are trying ex ante to figure out what the meanings are of their boilerplate agreements that they're entering into with thousands or even millions of consumers. Right? A firm might decide to start pre-testing their contract language in the same way that a firm with a manufactured product is not just going to release it onto the marketplace without having first tested it with ordinary consumers to see if it breaks, to see if it injures people. So when, you're, when you have a physical product, any firm worth its salt is going to do a lot of beta testing, and yet almost no firms are doing beta testing with their contractual terms, and our approach makes it pretty easy to do exactly like that. These surveys are getting really cheap. Maybe you have to pay people 2 or $3 for 10, 15 minutes of their time. It's not extraordinarily expensive. And so for a cost much lower than the billable hours of hiring out a partner at a big law firm for 10 years, you can actually generate some certainty about what a contract will mean in the eventuality that it gets litigated and that a court is called upon to decide what it means in the future. I'll throw out um, quickly some other pros and some drawbacks, uh, some cons to the proposal. We think actually, as I suggested earlier, that in some instances, the cost of survey have declined so much that you can actually um, resolve ambiguity through surveys much more cheaply than you can resolve ambiguities by hiring a bunch of lawyers 
to pour over the precedents, to think about interpretive canons, and to use traditional lawyering techniques. We also know that judges are just really different from ordinary people, and that might cause their perspectives when they're trying to interpret words to be different. Judges are older, wealthier, way better educated than ordinary people, and all of these things might cause them to construe words differently. The other thing we think is likely to happen is that in a world where firms are held to a contractual meaning that would be supplied by ordinary consumers who actually read the contract, that this would have a dynamic effect in changing the way that contracts are written. One of these is probably beneficial, the other is probably not. So I'll talk about both of those. If Google is held to the meaning of a contract that ordinary consumers would actually supply, then we think they're going to really try and clarify their language. They're going to try and streamline it. They're going to try and make each provision shorter than it already is. They're going to get rid of the kind of legalese that drives people mad. That's a good, that's a good thing. On the other hand, we do think it's likely that the contracts could get longer. Right? They'll start realizing that they're going to be held to whatever interpretation people come up with. So they're going to have a lot of very clear provisions stacked onto one another. And that's bad from our perspective because the longer contracts are, the lower the likelihood that the contract as a whole will actually be read by consumers. And we think while consumers are unlikely to read contracts, when they do, if they decide the time is, uh, is worth it, that's a good thing rather than a bad thing. They're genuinely consenting to the agreement. Um, I think the other big advantage that, uh, that resonates with a lot of practicing attorneys that we talk to about this idea is that there's a real ossification of boilerplate contract language. Let's say you're a general counsel for a company and you think, you know, looking at our privacy policy or looking at our basic sales agreements with consumers, there's a lack of clarity there. There's things I wish we could clean up. There's a new reality, a new practice that we're engaged in in our company. It'd be really nice if we could tweak the contractual language to better reflect that. Okay, those seem like exactly the kinds of things that a lawyer would want to do, so why don't lawyers do it? Well, if language has already been construed by a court to mean X, if you just tweak that language a little bit, all of a sudden, that precedent that was hopefully beneficial to your company might be easily distinguishable by a plaintiff's attorney. Right? There's going to be real risk aversion to making changes in contractual terms in a world where precedents construing a particular set of terms are going to loom so large in ultimate interpretation. And so what we're going to argue in this paper is that if we actually allow this kind of survey interpretation method to carry a lot more weight, it's actually going to enable firms to experiment. And they might know, we can tweak this, we can move this, we can get rid of that clause. And it's not going to change the way that ordinary people interpret the contract. And they can figure that out by doing exactly the kind of randomized experiments that we're conducting in this paper. I think some of the other objections to the proposal concern things like, well, you can hire a charlatan and they might cherry pick data. Uh, and the result might be that you'll see a whole bunch of purportedly pro-company uh, pro, uh, interpretations that aren't real and that uh, wouldn't be arrived at if you had disinterest, disinterested uh, and ethical social scientists doing the research. That's always a real uh, concern. Um, there's the concern about contract length that I mentioned. There's uh, the probability of dueling expert witnesses, and you do see, you do see a fair bit of that in the trademark uh, context, and judges have to figure out which of two dueling expert witnesses is more believable. Uh, juries have to do that sometimes. Um, and finally, we wouldn't claim that this method does a particularly good job of resolving contractual ambiguity that no one sees coming. Okay? This is a good approach for dealing with contractual ambiguity that is apparent to a good lawyer on the face of the document, but not all contractual ambiguity is that way. And I think I want to say our approach doesn't do a good job of dealing with the kinds of ambiguity that won't be anticipated by counsel, but neither do the other traditional methods for interpreting contracts uh, as well. Okay, um, uh, penultimate slide, I guess. Uh, there's places you can think about this approach beyond the realm of consumer contract interpretation. A lot of contracts are aimed not at ordinary consumers, but at sophisticated actors, 
um, people who are involved in an in a industry. Uh, and you can imagine this approach translating where we're interested in interpretation among people in the cotton industry or the diamond industry or something like that. And our approach there would say, don't sample lay people to figure out what a contract means between a jeweler and a diamond wholesaler. Rather, survey 70 people in the diamond industry, and to the extent that there are terms of art, have those terms of art be dispositive. We think there's applications of this approach for class actions. A lot of consumer class actions run into class certification issues when the following scenario arises. The contract has been changed, and so uh, defense counsel is going to say, okay, there's all these consumers who were injured by something that the defendant did, but uh, the people who signed the pre-2016 version of the contract can't be grouped into a class with the people who signed the post-2016 version of the contract because they're different contracts. Therefore, there aren't the common issues of law and fact that justify unified treatment as a class action. I think our approach potentially allows uh, plaintiff's lawyers to call BS on those kinds of claims, where it turns out that you randomly assign people to read the pre-2016 contract or the post-2016 contract and find no significant differences between uh, the contractual language. You can try this approach on jury instructions. A lot of the time, a jury instruction will be not exactly what the law requires, but kind of close. Um, this allows you to randomly figure out whether the slight deviations from the ideal jury instructions make a difference. Um, uh, I have a separate paper uh, which, um, uh, which is going to be coming out uh, later this year that does the same thing with Miranda warnings. Right? Oftentimes, police get the Miranda warnings slightly wrong. And what we've done is we've randomly assigned people to read either the correct Miranda warnings or the incorrect Miranda warnings to see whether that made a difference in their substantive understanding of the Miranda rights. Punchline is, it never makes a difference. Um, and then finally, there's other authors who've, th who've thought about uh, using this approach for statutory interpretation. So really, the big que question we're asking is, what's the right future for contract interpretation? You know, the image on the right uh, is sort of traditionally. This is how it's been done, a judge uh, poring over precedents, figuring out what it means. The image on the left, you know, sort of crowdsourcing contract interpretation that we think uh, has a lot of virtue. So um, if you're interested in the whole argument, uh, it just came out in the N NYU Law Review. It's available uh, on the web. And uh, now is my time to stop talking and uh, start answering uh, your questions. Uh, so thanks very much for listening. And uh, the floor is yours. Got a good 12, 13, 14 minutes. Uh, Gabriel, yeah. So you mentioned a bit that consumers tend not to read contracts. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that then means that contracts are written not for consumers, but for either arbitrators or courts that ultimately resolve disputes. And if that's the case, then what about surveying, sort of like you said, diamond experts? What about surveying? arbitrators or contract attorneys or courts to figure out how to resolve ambiguous clauses. Great. Okay. So I'm just going to um, uh, repeat the question uh, since I'm not sure that the, the podcast listeners would have, would have heard it. So a uh, great question said, asks, um, you know, who is a contract really written for? Is a contract really written for consumers if consumers don't read it? Or is a contract rather written for arbitrators uh, or lawyers or judges? Um, or maybe, uh, in some cases, regulatory agencies that are trying to figure out whether a practice was unfair, deceptive in trade. OK, it's a great question. I'll tell you that at least the, the, the formalistic legal answer is that a consumer contract is really supposed to be written for consumers. And indeed, in thinking about you know, sort of why do we defer to contracts, right? Why do we, um, uh, why do we not just trust the um, the regulatory state through command and control policies to dictate what the terms of every commercial agreement are. The sort of theory behind that is that the firm and the consumer that are entering into this contractual arrangement have some private information about what's going to make them better off or worse off, and they're acting on the basis of that information. Now we might say, okay, but it's a legal fiction. Uh, consumers don't read these contracts. And re it's really the case that consumers almost never read these contracts. I guess what I want to say is 
in part, we want to take that formalistic no notion of autonomy and consent seriously. But in part, we also do want to point to the dynamic effects. Right? One of our claims here is that if contracts are actually written for that audience of ordinary consumers, then at least those consumers who really do care about particular provisions are more likely to read them. And you know, I guess for normative reasons, we want to live in a world where that consent is not just a legal fiction, but an actual reflection of the idea that entering into this arrangement is going to make the consumer better off. And so that's really our pitch. Now, there are alternative theories of contract interpretation that say, you know, <laughs> regardless of what the firm believes, regardless of what the consumer believes, the contract should be interpreted in a wealth maximizing way or something like welfare maximizing way. Those interpretations are out there. Courts don't generally adopt them. Okay? Uh, very few instances in which at least courts will admit that that's what they're doing. What courts usually admit to doing is applying precedents and interpretive canons, their conception of what the plain language of the contract is. And we think there's really not that much to be said for that in comparison to our proposal. But it's a, it's a great, it's a great um, question. It's, it, it's for the first principles. Like when, when we're interpreting contracts, what should we be trying to do? And how much do we really care about that idea of individual consent? Um, yeah, Michael. Um, so I'm concerned with courts being held captive by the, the, the wisdom of the crowd and, mm -hmm. and having to you know, gain confidence in the survey methodology and statistics. Couldn't an easier way of doing this be having a, a, construing the contracts against the drafter and thereby encouraging the firms themselves to invest in this sort of uh, side of their business to get the most plain use, most commonly understood contract? before they ever get before. OK, so um, I want to make sure, uh, and I, I may come back to you, because I, I think I want to make sure I understand the, uh, the question. So the idea is, um, would an approach like this cause um, firms to rigorously test their language to make sure that the interpretations that they think apply to the contract are the ones that ordinary consumers think would apply to the contract? Um, OK, with respect, to, with respect to that part of your question, I want to say yes, and, and we, think that's, we think that's a good thing. But there's another part of your question that I'm not sure I've, I've, I fully got. So, so what, have, what have I missed? So instead of having this become part of like, the litigation process, mm -hmm. why not just have the, the courts construe the, the ambiguous clause of the contract against the drafter? Well, so the issue is good. Okay, so the question is, why not just apply a contra preferentum? Why not just say if there's ambiguity, then it's the fault of the drafter? And I think what I want to say is, uh, our argument certainly in the article is going to be, we don't have a good mechanism at present for figuring out what counts as ambiguity. And what our data shows is, you can create the clearest possible language, right? Perfectly clear language language that's so clear that your 1L contracts professor you know, beams with pride. And there's still, if you sample 100 people, there's still going to be 10 to 15% who come out the other way. And why people are doing that? I heard crazy people. Maybe. Yeah, maybe crazy people. Uh, so why are people doing that? Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe we can't provide people with high-powered enough incentives to get it right. And we could try a different kind of experiment that rewards people for getting the answers that most people pick. So we could think about tweaking the methodology. But you know, I think what the data that we've collected also suggests is there are some people who you know, are very non-legalistic in the way they think about disputes and sort of don't really care what's written down. It's a minority. They don't really care what's written down. But they just sort of, do I like this person or do I like that person? Uh, and I think what I want to say is, in a world where, um, where a good lawyer can make almost any language seem ambiguous, there's a big zone of uncertainty that arises. And it makes it harder for companies to invest, makes it harder for um, companies to plan, makes it harder for plaintiffs class action lawyers to figure out which suits they should bring and which suits aren't worth their time. 
And the way we see interpreting contracts by surveys and experiments it's working is it's reducing that zone of uncertainty. There's still going to be close cases near the boundary. Whatever boundary you pick, whether it's 50-50 or 60-40 as to what constitutes ambiguity, there's going to be some cases that are right around that boundary. There's going to be a lot of cases that maybe become quite arguable as to whether there's ambiguity or not, depending on which judge you happen to draw, which become completely inarguable in our world, where what you have to do is look at the American population as a whole, which isn't going to vary from circumstance to circumstance. And so that predictability, we think, is probably the, the biggest purported advantage of our new approach. Um, other uh, 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 thoughts? Um, uh, Colin, let's start with you. Yeah. <coughs> I having trouble thinking of a perfect example, but I can imagine a world in which 50 years later the interpretation by the general public of a specific sentence or a specific phrase might have changed Good. rather drastically. Yeah. And I'm wondering what you think that would mean to, like, say, a contract that's been used by a certain firm for a long period of time. Do you have to revisit that something like every 10 years? Like, is there a, I don't know, like, do care uh, requirement for firms? Good. OK, so the question is, well, what happens if interpretations really do change over time? Words change. Um, you know, if we think back to, uh, to the Constitution of the United States, there's some words in the Constitution that mean different things to the contemporary audience that they've meant to the founding generation. A good, advantage, a good example of that might be um, the Copyright Clause and Patent Clause, which says, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Well, science actually refers to art. And the useful arts refers to technology. But when we think science today, nobody, nobody refers to science as, as art. In the, so the meaning of science has changed, or at least the predominant meaning of science has changed over time. Uh, and, and I think your, your question suggests the right answer. Maybe over the span of 10 or 20 or 100 years, the meaning of contracts could change. We don't know, because we don't have any data on that, but it strikes me as totally plausible. And so maybe the best practices for a company are to rerun this survey every 10 years, rerun this survey every 20 years. If there's a contractual provision that really, really matters to them, well, what should matter to them is not how people interpreted it 20 years ago, but how their current consumers are interpreting it. And I think I want to say, this stuff's cheap enough to where that's not such a big deal. Okay, so. Today, you can buy 1,200 reliable respondents and 15 minutes of time from each of them for $2,800, $3,000. It's peanuts to a big company. Uh, peanuts when we think about their overall legal budgets. And so uh, that expense seems not, uh, uh, not, not uh, terribly onerous if they have to do that kind of updating. They update all their other product features, too. Um, uh, Evan, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah, I was curious. Uh, so, uh, a bunch of the example cases really covered uh, sort of more, you know, company-based corporate contracts. And I was curious what you think the impact of this would be on uh, smaller scale civilian, you know, contracts between civilians, Good. where one party might not be a company that can review a con review the language with counsel or spend time surveying uh, lay respondents as to how they interpret the language. How how might these uh, recommendations? impact you know one-on-one -on -one contracts with civilians. Great. So um, uh, so the question is, you know, will this work for really unsophisticated parties that are entering into contracts? So imagine like a sale of a used car from one consumer to another consumer. Can this work? I think I would say probably not. The most ambitious version of the proposal would be something like this. If courts actually started listening to us in the same way that they've long been doing this for trademark litigation, they started doing this more regularly for contract interpretation, then you could imagine enterprising people, I would think it would mostly be academics, who would actually go out and test um, what an ordinary, you know, unsophisticated consumer to unsophisticated consumer contract might look like. All right? so, uh, you know, this would be a good job for an enterprising graduate student with like a psychology or political science background. Uh, piece together what a, what a, a, a fairly clear uh, sales agreement would be for a used car and then spend a few thousand dollars testing out the terms to make sure people understand them. Post it on the web and post your data on the web. 
right? It's sort of like a like a, a way of contributing to the public good if you're interested in surveys and applying them to law to sort of create these um, these sort of form agreements so that people don't have to go through the trouble of incurring those kinds of expenses. And presently, you find that all the time with things like wills, right? So you can go to a bookstore and buy a book that'll have a sample will. Um, and hopefully, it's been vetted by an attorney at some point. Hopefully, if you sign it, it's not going to get you into too much trouble. But don't expect that the kind of will you can purchase off the shelf is going to be as good as the kind of will you can purchase from a trust and estates lawyer. Uh, so you can imagine doing something like this and presenting data to people that says, well, you know, let's say you really want to make sure that the sale is as is. If you phrase it this way, that's what you get. If you phrase it this way, then it's ambiguous. You could present that data to people such that, okay, someone, who, someone would have to be sophisticated enough to at least look for this model agreement. But if they're sophisticated enough to get there, then, um, uh, then you can do a lot of the legal work for them and save them the expense of either hiring a lawyer or incurring the uncertainty that they prefer not to incur. I was um, sworn to finish uh, the talk by 1.20, so unfortunately we're out of time, but I'll stick around if any of you'd like to uh, talk more about the proposal, or you can come find me in my office. Thanks. Thank you.